Hello YouTube, this is Maestro here, bringing you another Omaha video. I'm just going to play four tables today to try to allow myself an opportunity to take a little more time with my decisions and to, to really provide a little more thorough analysis of some of the spots that I get into. I'm going to follow the standard naming convention of those one, two, three, four. Obviously a pretty good flop for me on table one. Kind of unfortunate that villain don't decide to see bet. It's pretty tough to categorize his play after only seven hands. But I think my best approach versus him uh, be to wait for stronger than average situations. I think that he's not the sort of player you have to lay down. I, I really don't like raising in this spot when villain limps and I'm on the big blind. I think that even, you know, okay hands should be checked there. You have to acknowledge your positional disadvantage, but Absolute rock crushers like King King A7 double suited. I think I'm gonna find enough flops to play profitably. Note that villain open lamp 10 10 8 7, pretty strong hand. This probably indicates some degree of passivity. I might take a stab on this on later streets if villain continues to check. And I don't think there's anything wrong per se with betting the ace queen jack flop when you've got just nine high. So Got no read on sneaker here. These aren't even his stats, those are Captain Hammer's stats. Oh, I do have a read. He's, uh, oh, but it's only over three hands. <laughs> Not really the flop I, flop I was hoping for. I think that I would have, you know, continued more broadly uh, with a pair with flush draw. A lot of flops I, I would have got in there. Um, and note how, what terrible shape I was in pre- Villain opens again. Um, I feel like taking a flop with this hand. You know, I've got some. <laughs> this time I would have killed the flop. Uh, I've got some playability here, double suited. I'm I'm short stacked. I'm out of position. I'm very very short. So I think that you know trying to take flops when you're short. This is the third hand in the row that Sneaker raised free. The first one, he had a pretty strong hand. I guess it doesn't really matter since I'd probably be three betting even an extremely tight player, let alone somebody, uh, an unknown, who's been raising a lot frequently. I think maybe, uh, okay, maybe this explains it. Uh, maybe the dynamic between Sneaker and Schlimbovic 
explains why he's raising so frequently. Uh, this guy seems to be cold calling my three bets. Uh, never folding. I, I might top up to max here. Don't laugh at my <laughs> account balance here. Uh, back of diamonds. Yeah, I'm, I'm drained it. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> I guess that sort of <laughs> and look at the chat here. That's that's one advantage of being short stacked is you know these guys <laughs> can be in a war and then I can get the pot when he just floats along <laughs> min check raises with nothing and then pounds the turn with nothing. I find I find that hand incredibly amusing. I don't know about you guys. So I'm going to be watching this dynamic between Schlizovich and Sneaker one 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 one. I think that this is the sort of thing that if you're not paying attention to, uh, it'll easily cause you. To misjudge situations. Drinking a little Red Bull here, trying to get a little caffeinated energy so I can really do this video properly for you. I think this is a close decision on table three. I really don't like these danglers. I am double suited. I'm in good position. Oh, this is Sneaker again. Oh, and I timed out. I'm not sure uh, if Sneaker's really been rebetting that often. Okay, so table one. Villain didn't raise me on the flop. So I'm thinking maybe if he's got me beat, it's by a week two pair. And who knows, he might fold it. But I'm thinking he's got some combination of weak draws. Pair, open ended, sort of weak flush draw, got shot, something like that. Now, here, just kind of want a three bet. I think his button range would be pretty wide. I've got some connectivity with my jacks in case I am behind. But I'm going to be out of position. It looks like I am behind. Maybe I should have flattered her a little bit. Yeah, pretty, pretty badly behind. <laughs> and it boats up. So maybe, maybe it wasn't the smartest decision. Or maybe I'm being results oriented. I mean, my hand looks pretty good against the bottom open. Uh, maybe I I drew too much inference from from a four sample size of stats. Maybe flatting was the best play. Here I've got a weak flush against an erratic loose player. He definitely could be bluffing me here. Uh, he's shown bluffs before. If I, I, I think if I call on the the turn here, I'm committed to calling the big river bet. So I'm gonna let it go. Thing is, the the pot was five cents on the flop, and. Really bad flop from my hand here. Uh, it, was, it was five cents on the flop. And the deuce. <laughs> Thanks. So, do I really want to end up putting, you know, 80 cents in with an eight high flush? One of the great things I think about playing literally for pennies is that I'm not very emotionally affected 
by the wins and losses. So I can more dispassionately consider the hands, consider the information I have available. And, and I think these games are still decently tough so that it's not like you're playing at the play money tables where, you know, villains are irrational or they're not really trying to win. They don't really care if they win. And I think that you see the sort of um, aberrant play in psychology at these tables that you might hope to find uh, at, at other games. Here I've gotten um, almost exactly a third of my stack in pre. And it's heads up. He's got the king. He's got the king. He's got the king. <laughs> hey, said. I think I have to. I'm really, really not doing well at this table. I, I think I have to stick it in there. Maybe not, but uh, this table. Sneaker, image, four bedroom. Uh, all. Nice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in here. Top pair. I'm sort of surprised he checks, but. Yeah, I should have put it in three. In, in, maybe he had some sort of rundown. And that the last hand where he had ace king, Ray Greg double suited. You know, pretty pretty good case for folding, I think. Pre flop the first time, second time. Um But on the flop, you know, if he had bet, I would have I would have snapped, gotten into the pot. Because the only thing you're really afraid of is aces, and with an ace in your hand, ace on the board, it just becomes more and more less likely. You know, queens or ace queen obviously can still have you beat, but you beat so many jack eye rundowns, ten eye rundowns, over double pair hands, etc. I think this format might be a little better than the eight tabling. Obviously, you don't get as many hands, but I think that just allows a little more time to talk about general principles. And if you do have a tough decision, you now you've got some time to, to sort of, you know, break down the hand, understand what's going on. This is, this is more and more important as you get deeper. I think that in Omaha, short stack knit play tends to be very cookie cutter. Whereas, whereas deep stack play requires a little more insight, understanding, thought. You have to, you know, really be aware. Is this guy three betting at twenty five percent? Okay. But but how much of that? <laughs> it's been a long time since I got quads in in Omaha. I think. You're supposed to, to pot it here and make some sort of play, but <laughs> Ooh. turn it pretty gin. Could have been the ton of hearts, you know, or in a spades would have been better, but <laughs> now question is, do I be concerned about Queen Jack with clubs or do I rely on the power of my um, free roll? I think he is probably free rolling me with clubs here. No, I'm free rolling him. All right. So uh, nice little uh, little four out free roll. Uh, Ten percent of the time, I'm gonna scoop that pot. Never gonna lose. So pretty 
pretty profitable situation on the turn. And and the reason why I'm in that situation and he's not is because I'm playing Ace Queen Jack Eight, and he's playing, you know, whatever. He's playing Queen Jack Eight Deuce with yeah. Every every suit appears to be represented there, so he does have a Badoogie. Some people think that if you're a skilled poker player, you can play looser than your opponents and outplay them on future streets. Whether or not this is true, I don't see why you can't just outplay your opponents pre-flop as well as post-flop and fold, and you know come come into the game with come into the flop with with hands that hit harder, that that flop better. Maybe I'm just trying to rationalize my, my weak knit behavior, but I think that I think that an exchange between Tommy Angelo and another poster on the forum, you know, a poster asked him, why, why are you old guys all such ridiculous knits? Angelo replied, because all the non-knits went broke. I think that it's going to be tough to go broke playing too tight, but you play too loose and, and you can be gone like that. So, so this is especially true in the arena of live poker where you see so few hands that these theories aren't really put to the test. You know, you can play for six months or a year, you know, especially if you don't put it in like 20 hour sessions all the time. And, and you can win with a losing strategy. So especially when you consider, you know, how many people attempt this, right? Some of them are bound to win. You have pretty good connectivity here. Bad position with regards to these three. This guy's been pretty active. Um, the, the nines, I think, really weaken the hand. You know, gonna gonna get more dominated reps. Sort of weary about entering with this hand, but uh, three But I do have good connectivity, good position. It's just, I don't know, I, I think this hand's a bit of a long shot. 10, 10, 9, 7. Yeah, clubs, I'm not going to be very happy about. And so I'm basically playing for top set, straights, and wraps. Um, it's, but, you know, I'm, I'm in the cutoff, so it's, you can you can open up a bit. and. There is pretty good connectivity here. I think it's probably probably one of those hands that's pretty close on the margin. It could be could be open worthy. You know, might might be good for my image to uh, be opening some hands like this. And and you know maybe not so much in this exact situation, but you know as a general principle, you do uh, some sometimes you know. It's good to, to play some hands, maybe like right at the start of a session. You know, if you, if you fold 35 hands in a row and then open from the cutoff, it's not like people are gonna be like, wow, this guy's a huge action player. But if you picked up, you know, a couple big hands in the first five, six hands, open them, you know. Uh, so it just leads right out, eh? Get about a three SVR, no draws, and a pretty weak one pair hand. We got the backdoor flush draw. I don't know what Iron's gonna do, and I'm getting about four to one. Okay, first three bet. 
think I should just lay these queens down. First three back in 15 hands. Okay. But he didn't have that many opportunities. He's been going pretty wild, raising. Here. Okay. So. Blue cards. In there. So, he could easily have one of my suits covered. Um, Tense of flopping queen, not that great. Seven of the nine actually aren't that close to the queen, so. Not much straight potential. I think I'm just going to toss it. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Should I have taken a flop? Should I have four bet all in? You know, that's, uh, he only had, I guess, two opportunities. Probably going to bet fold this year. If he raises. He only had two opportunities to three bet before. So, I mean, that's not really too indicative. I'll pull a few bets. And maybe I should have uh, backed the flop when they checked me. It's my, uh, my flush try there. Let's check that hand out again. Um, double suited queens. I opened three bets from the small blind. Uh, hasn't three bet in 15 hands, but it looked like he didn't have many opportunities to do so. He has been going pretty wild. Um, calling and raising. So maybe I should have just four bet all in there. Here. Two guys behind me in position. I don't, I don't really, I don't know. These hands just never seem to flop for me. I think, uh, I think if you're in late position, you know, lots of people limping in. It's really fine. You will. You know, you can really, really crush some people with draws here. Thinking, thinking I'm going to pot this. Uh, I hate the dangler, though. I'm going to be able to get, what, 29 cents in presently. A little more now. Oh, we're not. A little risky. With the three. You know, I could be in really bad shape to aces or kings. And I'm going to take a flop here. Playable hand. Not a position. But. Ooh, killed it. So. Much drunk gut shot over the pair. A lead trying to get it in on the flop. Could really be crushing some draws. I've also got the marginal main hand. He's got hearts and Jackson sevens, but I got Jackson Kings now. Hurrah. So I'm going to try to get it in here. I'm just going to shove any turn. Uh, I think that really be dominating the draw. If he's got a set, I'm probably not even in that terrible shape. That hand's not that great for me. But still had some outs, so. Um. Interesting to see the equities there. He's got two pair and the blockers to my flush draw. The flop can hit three or ten or club or eight. So I think I'm around 40, 45%. Pretty sure I'm a dog. Let's test it out. Great website, incidentally, ProPokerTools.com. I've got uh, 
don't think these are the exact suits, but it shouldn't matter. Open limping for a fish. I just put these in. Windows 8 is kind of annoying. Shouldn't matter. No, need to, uh, <laughs> not the full board there. Should be close enough. Oh, looks like I was a slave favorite. Which I'm kind of surprised with. What's going on here? Unless this guy misclicked, could well be. Okay. Maybe I should have just gotten in here. I was sort of alarmed by his. He has a plate of hand in 23 hands. Yeah, deuce fours out there. I think. Oh, he's kind of deep, so he could have. He could have been raised. Um, try to get it in with aces. Try to get somebody to reopen the door. But he wanted a slow plate on that flop. And I think uh, it's it's too much of a reverse implied odd situation here. Continue. Out of position, I'm not going to three bet this hand, despite having you know a really strong hand. Uh, villain checks back the flop. I don't think he's got spades, so. I think I can bet profitably. This, this guy's clearly got six seven. Notch. The German. That says good, yeah. That's my impression of being a German. So maybe I should have uh maybe I should have uh, raised my my ace queen jack ten there. I was just, I was thrown off by Malibu Keys never having played a hand at 24 hands. Yeah, that should block that up. So, a little surprising that I was actually a favorite with uh, my overpair, not flash drive, got shot. I think if I'm a lot deeper, it might be better to to flat these aces. But preflop raiser is pretty short. This guy is pretty short. I've got three pair and top set. There's simply no way anybody can have anything to pay me off here. I have all the cards. Cleared myself. Wish I could. Could trade the king of the four with one of these guys. <laughs> you mean whatever card you want, I'll give you. I'll give you the king of the four. It's up to you. I guess. I guess. Uh, you know, two, three, five, queen, jack, ten could call. All those cards, those six cards I just mentioned, could kill my action on the turn. Uh, you know, slow play in Omaha very often. If at all, uh, you do sometimes. But you can sometimes. The nut flush is actually, you know, in a big multi-way pot. That's that's one example that's often profitable to slow play. I also slow play aces a lot pre, not so much just slow play, but um, to, uh, to keep the pot small for when I miss the flop. In in certain situations, especially when I'm out of position and deep, where the penalty for basically playing my hand face up is is very severe, uh, much more severe than than whatever preflop equity I gain by by putting in the raises. Um, I'll just just 
check here. And with the board paired, and just the second nut flush, I don't really like calling when I can so easily be drying dead. Now, it's a little less likely I'm drying dead because this guy checked the flop, but you know, was, I, mean, I could have checked bottom two or something. I'm planning to flat with nines, ace, king, double suited here. And then check raise good flops. Um, or lead out if there's another player in the hand. Definitely be check raising here. Uh, I don't see him checking behind a lot on this flop. Uh, pretty good board run out so far. Probably have best hand, best drop. So, here I flop, um, pretty good wrap. 7, 8, 10, queen, king. So, so like 17 outs here, no flush draw on the board. Uh, I'm already all in, damn it. I should have reloaded, not uh, played for just four sets. But, Pretty good shape. Um, actually, could even be a dog with my wrap. Just he's been beat by Bones King High, and he's, uh, you know, I want to run the numbers on that one, but I, I think, uh, I think actually you'll be surprised at what my equity is there. Just, he's, he's got the 10 crushed, and uh, the 10 cups he wins, and no, I gotta still be the favorite, but it's probably only like 60 40. Um, and he's got a high card king, so deuce deuce, and I suffer a shameful defeat. But, you know, I'm gonna run that after. See how I do versus his hand versus top side. Just for my own curiosity. Great feature of Hold'em Manager 2 is it shows you equities when you look up hands on every street, so it's pretty sweet. Not a lot going on. Um, the stables are all really juicy. Average VP lowest is 41. I think that's a you know pretty decent way to table select, but it's not perfect. Um, yeah, if you've got like three Uber nets and then one super crazy fish, or you got a table with four tough legs, you know the four tough legs could have a higher average VP. But I'd much prefer the first table. I know exactly what's going on pretty much. Was, the legs are just going to put me in tough spots all day long. I mean, I might prefer the second table for training purposes, but when it comes to making money, you know, when it comes to playing for for appreciable stakes and making money, I much prefer to play against uh, straightforward bad players or you know people who is who have very obvious weaknesses. Not that you know a really tight knit is a bad player, but. Uh, you know, they're not going to be too tough to play against. And you're going to be making money off the, the really, really loose player. So this guy's uh, going pretty wild. Opening 80% of hands. And I've got an above average hand, not like an amazing hand or anything. But I'm going to hit a lot of flops. So. A lot of flops enough to continue. Here I've got just the gut shot. And the point, uh, SVR. Probably, probably should just check. You know, if the diamond was a club, definitely be checking. Could get, uh, ace jack to fold. Be nice. Not bad shape. 
Nope. Well, it's, uh, that's an alright spot to end this video. I think uh, there were some interesting situations, and hopefully you can share your comments, criticisms, uh, viewpoints with me, and we can learn from this whole experience. So, until next time.